Did anyone bring a Bible to church with you this morning? I want to know who brought a Bible. In fact, I want to know the type of people we have in the room. So let's do this. If you're a clicker, if you use an electronic Bible, I want to, I want to see it. I want you to hold it up in the air right now. Who's a clicker? Hold it up. All right. All right. Okay, put those down. What about flippers? Do we have any page flippers? If you use a paper Bible, hold it up in the air if you've got it with you today. All right, we got some flippers. Now, what about this? Who's got a leather Bible? Hold it up. No paperback or hardback for you, nothing but leather. Hold it high. Be proud. We're going to call you the spenders. And that is no joke because Christina and I went Bible shopping this holiday season. We actually, many of you know my daughter Courtney is studying to be in the ministry. So we wanted to get her her first study Bible, like not just a daily Bible, not a daily reader, but a study Bible that she could use to prepare sermons. And so we went to the local Christian bookstore and started looking at Bibles, and my goodness, talk about sticker shock. They're crazy expensive. It makes it hard to believe that they say that there are 168,000 Bibles a day that are either bought or gifted. 168,000 Bibles a day. At 90 bucks a pop, I don't know how that happens. But it's an investment in her future, right? I love Bibles. I love that we have them. Well, whether you are a clicker, a flipper, or a spender, I want to invite you to click or flip in your Bible this morning to Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 105. And then if you're using a paper Bible, Place a marker in 2 Timothy chapter 3, because later we're going to be turning there, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Today I'm going to be reading from the God's Word translation, and today we're talking about walking in the light. Walking in the light. Has anyone ever tried to walk anywhere in the dark? Raise your hand if you've ever tried to walk somewhere in the dark. Man, that's no fun, is it? Even if you're going somewhere you know where stuff is, it's, it's difficult to navigate your way in the dark. I remember this one time, I was in the youth area of our previous church, the Trinity Fellowship in Fayetteville, and we were getting ready to leave, it was the middle of the day, we were getting ready to leave, and I had forgotten something upstairs in the youth area. So I parked my car and, and ran upstairs, and those of you who aren't familiar with that space, the light switch for that space is at the top of the main stairs. But on the end, the other side of the building, there's an emergency exit with a fire escape, and that's the door that I used to go in because it was a lot quicker, and I could just pull up my car and, and go up there. But there's no light switch. Well, when I was coming into the building, the door was still open behind me, and the daylight was coming in, so I, I just ran through to get from the youth lounge to the sanctuary, which is where this item I had left was. And everything was fine. But when I came out of the sanctuary, by the time I got out, the door that had been open was now closed, and it was dark. I mean, really, really dark. You know how there's different scales of darkness? I've, I've always been amazed how my house, even when all the lights are out, it's never dark. Like, I don't know how I even sleep at night without a blindfold because there's lights coming from everywhere. There are lights from televisions and computers and routers and phones and, and even the street light shining into the window. My house never gets dark. But this youth lounge I was in doesn't have any of those things. It has no windows. It has no TVs or no computers or no routers or no phones. It was really, really dark. And I didn't have my phone with me. I had left it in the car. So there I was stuck in this extremely dark room with roughly 35 feet between myself and the exit door. But it wasn't a big deal because I had walked that path thousands of times. I mean, thousands of times I had walked from where I was to the exit door and it was a straight shot from me to the door and there was nothing in front of me so I just took off walking very quickly almost running because we were in a hurry people were outside they were waiting on me so I just took off making a beeline towards the door I wish that I could tell you 
that I got to the door safely and unimpeded, and the rest of the day was just a normal day. Unfortunately, I can't. Because as I was walking quickly in the dark, I felt a sudden and severe pain in my knee, followed by a sudden and severe pain in my thigh. The reason I felt these pains was because I had forgotten that the night before was a Wednesday night, and we had had service, and one of my youth sponsors had decided to rearrange the furniture in the youth lounge and had moved the foosball table into the path that I had walked thousands of times. And this foosball table was what I felt hitting my knee and then my thigh hitting the corner of it on the top. Man, did that hurt. Raise your hand if you have a similar kind of story. Like you have a story of trying to find your way through the dark and you've gotten hurt. Most of us have been there at one point in time in our lives. Now, those of you who didn't raise your hands, I noticed you also looked at me with a smug look. And I know why, because you were thinking, no, dummy. I've never had that happen because I don't walk places in the dark. I choose to walk in the light. Well, if that's you, I have bad news for you. Because today you braved the weather for no reason. Because today we're talking about walking in the light. Let's look at our passage. Psalms 119, 105. Just one verse all by itself in the longest chapter of the Bible. We've all heard it before. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. We've all heard this scripture before, right? We've even sung this as a song. Every, every since we were kids, there's been songs about your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. But I love the imagery that is used in this passage, in this scripture, because we don't know who wrote Psalms 119. But what we do know is that whoever wrote this chapter, whoever wrote this psalm, had a really rough life. They had a life that was full of trials and tribulations and persecution. In fact, most scholars believe that the writer was either David, Ezra, or Daniel. And the reason they believe that is because those three people had really bad times. Personally, I like to think that it was David. It, it sounds a lot like him. The writing is the same. And we know that he went through some rough things in his life. But the writer of Psalms 119 talks about plots and slanderers and taunts against them. And the writer talks about persecutions and afflictions that they had to face. In fact, many people say that persecution and affliction is the theme of Psalm 119. They say that Psalm 119, for lack of a better term, is about a sucking life. Verse 61 says, the ropes of wicked people are tied around me. That's not fun. Verse 86 says, those people persecute me with lies. In other words, they're lying about me, God. Verse 95 says, the wicked people have waited for me in order to destroy me. Man, this is a dark chapter to be the longest chapter in the Bible. I mean, that's a lot of darkness, right? Over and over again, the author says that they are being persecuted or afflicted. But I don't really believe that that's the theme of this psalm. Some people will tell you that the 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 top of the passage in a study Bible, some study Bibles will tell you that's the theme, but I don't think it is. I think that the theme is that God's word is sufficient in spite of all the things you're having to go through. You see verse 61 that I referred to where it says, the ropes of the wicked people are tied around me. In addition to that, it says, 
I will never forget your teachings. It says, though the ropes of the wicked are tied around me, I will never forget your teachings. Verse 95, it does say that the wicked people have waited for me in order to destroy me. But then it says, yet I want to understand your written instructions. In other words, no matter what's going on in my life, God, no matter how dark it is, no matter what I'm having to go through, no matter who's against me, I still love your word. I still love your word. And then right in the middle of this chapter, in the middle of all this darkness and in the middle of this author saying, in spite of everything I'm having to go through, I still love your word, God. He says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. What awesome imagery that is. No matter how dark life gets, no matter how difficult it is, and no matter how many twists and turns there are, and no matter how many obstacles there may be in my way, I have your word to light the way for me. I love this. Your word lights the way. I don't have to walk in darkness. I don't have to walk in fear. I don't have to walk in uncertainty, God, because your word lights the way. Instead of walking in those things, I can walk in the light. Your word will light my path. It will show me what's ahead of me. It will allow me to to navigate the path correctly and, and keep me from running into obstacles like foosball tables or rocks or holes. It'll keep me from wandering off into the woods in the wrong direction. Your word is a light. I like to think that David wrote this, and I like to think that he wrote it during the time of his life when he was running from Saul. We've all heard that story before, right? So, so David gets anointed as the next king of Israel, but Saul's the current king, and he's not a huge fan of that. So he hates David, and he's chasing him down, and he's trying to kill him. And David is honoring Saul. He's not going to take that position by force. He's going to wait until God's time is correct. But he's running from him. He's trying to just stay alive. He's running around singing that song. Oh, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Oh, 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 staying alive. That's Psalms 119. No matter what happens, I'm staying alive. That was so silly. Not in the notes. It just came to me. The spirit of song. I like to think that David had just finished with a treacherous hike through the woods, through the wilderness, and that he had gotten to the place where he was going to spend the night, whether it was a cave or, or a clearing. And I like to think that David was sitting there, and he began thinking about how treacherous the path was that got him there. And how without his torch or his lantern, he never would have made it. And then I like to think that In that moment, as David thought about those things, that the Holy Spirit showed him how similar that is to our lives and the Word of God. And I like to think that he sat down and he wrote, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I like to think. But I love that because if that's what happened, then what David wrote, excuse me, would centuries later be used to remind us that there was a light in the darkness. Because I don't have somebody chasing me down trying to kill me. Hopefully you don't either. If you do, please leave now. But I do live in this broken world. I do live a life here, and it's not always peaches and roses. I face trials and sufferings, and so do you. We get sick. Sometimes we get very sick. And sometimes our spouses and our children get very sick. And it breaks our heart, and we we beg and we ask God, why, why is this happening? 
Sometimes we lose loved ones and, and we feel like that we may never live again. That we may never have the opportunity to have joy in our lives again because our loved one is gone. Sometimes we have relationships that fall apart. And no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, we can't seem to fix them. Trials and tribulations. We lose jobs and sometimes have trouble finding new ones. We have cars that break down at the worst possible times. We live in a broken world, a world that's full of darkness. But we have a light. We have God's word that the writer of Psalm 119 reminded us is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. It helps us navigate the darkness. So what do we use this lamp for? For what do we use this lamp? For those of you who have already gotten there, we're going to catch up with you now in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3, we're going to start in verse number 10 and read through the end. This is a passage where Paul is writing to Timothy, one of his spiritual sons. And, and Paul is telling Timothy, kind of like, hey, before I die, here's some things you need to know. Like, really, this is one of the last books that Paul wrote. And he's like, hey, here I go now. <laughs> you need to know these things. Starting in verse number 10, he says, but you know all about my teachings, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You also know about the kind of persecutions and sufferings which happened to me in the cities of Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. I endured those persecutions, and the Lord rescued me from all of them. Verse 12, those who try to live a godly life because they believe in Christ will be persecuted. But evil people and phony preachers will go from bad to worse as they mislead people and are those themselves misled. However, continue in what you have learned and found to be true. You know who your teachers were. From infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. They have the power to give you wisdom so that you can be saved through faith in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 16, he says, Every scripture passage is inspired by God. All of them are useful for teaching, pointing out errors, correcting people, and training them for a life that has God's approval. They equip God's servants so that they are completely prepared to do good things. Paul lists four things here when he's writing to Timothy about how we should use the Scriptures. But I love how he sets this up. He reminds them, hey, don't forget about all the suffering and persecution that I've gone through. Maybe Paul wrote Psalms 119. He didn't because he wasn't alive, but don't forget about all the, the suffering and persecution that I've gone through. He says, but God got me through it. God got me through it. And then he tells him, oh, by the way, you're going to go through the same thing. And not just you, anyone who decides to follow Christ Jesus is going to be persecuted. Now, let me tell you why that's true. See, people get confused. People think that what he's saying here is that people hate Christians in that time, in that day, and so you're going to be persecuted because you're a Christian. Now, that is partially true. People did hate Christians during that time. In fact, they killed Jesus, right? They hated Christians, and they hated this religion. The religious elite hated it. But that's not what Paul's saying here. If you choose to follow Christ, you're going to be persecuted. Not because people hate Christians, but because 
the devil hates Christians. And the devil, as we've talked about before, if you don't know this already or if you haven't heard me say this, you can find it in Scripture, but the devil is the one who is in charge of this world that we live in. God has given him for a time that authority. So the devil who's in charge down here hates you if you believe in Jesus. So he's going to do everything he can to destroy you. And church, I've seen it happen more in the past year and a half than I've ever seen it in my life. And I don't know, I've told people this, I don't know if it's because I'm the lead pastor now, so I'm just aware of it more, and it's always been going on, or if it's because the devil really hates our church. Because I've seen people who have decided that they're going to come to church here, and the next day their wife is in the hospital and the the doctor's giving them 0% chance to live. I've seen that same person when the Lord healed her and, and brought her out of the hospital who has fought continually for the past year and a half with infections from that same situation and still is suffering. I've seen people who are so scared to come to church because they're afraid that the devil is going to kill either them or their wife. I've seen people who are a part of our congregation that have lost jobs and have have struggled to get even the simplest jobs. I've seen the devil fight this congregation so, so hard. Paul says, If you choose to follow Christ, you will be persecuted. But he reminds Timothy that God got him through it. And then he points him to the light that can help us navigate these persecutions. He points him to Scripture. He says every Scripture passage is inspired by God. Now the God's Word translation of this passage makes it really easy to understand. Every scripture is inspired by God. But I I feel like it does a poor job of carrying the full weight of what Paul is saying here. If you look at the NIV or the KJV or other versions, what you may see is where it says all scripture is God breathed. And then it says the rest and is useful for teaching. The Greek word that is translated there as God breathed or as inspired by God, is the word theonoustos. Everybody say theonoustos. Theonoustos. It's the combination of two words, two Greek words, the word theos and the word pneuma or pneuma. Has anyone ever heard the word theos? Maybe you've heard the word theology. What does theos mean? God. Theology is the study of God. Theos is the Greek word for God. And then pneuma. Have you ever heard a word like that? Our doctor over here was like pointing at herself. You ever heard the word pneumonia? You ever notice that the word pneumonia is spelled with a P in the front of it? Pneumonia comes from the same root, from this root word, pneuma. It means lungs or breath or source of life. In the Greek, this word was often used to refer to to the source of someone's life, the very breath that they had in their body. It was also used to refer to a flautist. Is that how you say the word? To a person who played the flute. Because they would raise the flute to their lips and then do what? Blow. They would breathe. Paul says every scripture is theonoustos. It is literally breathed from the life of God. Every scripture comes from God's life source. And then he tells us four things that it is useful for. 
He says, every scripture is God-breathed or is inspired by God, and it is useful for teaching, pointing out errors, correcting people, and training them for a life that has God's approval. And then he goes on to say that scripture equips God's servants so that they are completely prepared to do good things. Teaching pointing out errors, correcting people, and training them for a life that has God's approval. Briefly, I want to look at those things. I need to remind you that Paul is writing here to Timothy, who is a pastor. Timothy is a pastor, and Paul is telling this pastor how to use Scripture. He says the first thing it is useful for is teaching. What he's talking about there is teaching the way, teaching about Christ. You use the word to to show people that Christ is the only way to get to God, that Christ is the Son of God, and that he came, and that he lived a perfect life, and that he, he died for our sins. And you use Scripture to look back at the Old Testament and to see all of the prophecies about Jesus Christ. And how every one of them were fulfilled by only one man, Jesus Christ. Use scripture for teaching. Because that's the most important thing that we can do is to teach people about Jesus. To teach people about Jesus Christ and and what he means to us and what he can mean to them. How they too can have eternal life. He says it's also good for pointing out errors. In other words, letting us know when we're doing something wrong. Now remember, he's talking to a pastor here. See, there's, there's, there's two sides of the spectrum here that both get this wrong. One side says, oh, I'm going to get my Bible and I'm going to go start pointing out people's errors. I'm going to show everybody what they're doing wrong. Remember, he's talking to a pastor here. He's telling the pastor, you can point out people's errors. He's not telling you to grab your Bible and go on a crusade. But the other end of that spectrum is the end that says, preacher, you can't tell me what's right and wrong. You can't tell me what to do. They'll pull out that scripture that says, Everyone's supposed to work out their own salvation with much fear and trembling. Church, that's wrong too. If you have a spirit that tells you, that, that, that's telling you, if you have something inside of you that's telling you, I don't have to listen to him. Well, I hate to tell you, you're wrong. Because the Bible is truth, and it's truth whether you like it or not. And it never changes. It says that, that sexual immorality, or that, that for to be more specific, it tells you that sex outside of a marriage is wrong. Guys, I hate to tell you, it's wrong. doesn't matter if you like it, it's wrong. The Bible says that, that homosexuality is a sin, and, and I know a lot of churches, they use this as their bully pulpit, and it's the only thing they ever say. And you guys know me well enough to know that I'm not that person. If you're in the room today and and you struggle with homosexuality, I love you and I'm glad you're here. But the Bible never changes and the truth is, it's wrong. It's just as wrong for you as it, for, for, for a homosexual person to be in an inappropriate relationship as it is for a heterosexual person to be in an inappropriate relationship. And if you get in your mind, I don't gotta listen to that preacher. He can't point out my errors. Well, you're wrong. Because Paul says that's exactly one of the things that I'm supposed to do. And then it says correcting people. These two things sound like the same thing, right? But they're not. Because pointing out people's errors, again, we can't get into the the Greek about everything. But pointing out people's errors is when people are mistaken and they don't know it. Correcting people 
That's when they do know it, and they just choose. They choose to be defiant. And there's people like that. And one of the things that Scripture does is help us to show people that defiance is not acceptable. Rebellion is not acceptable. It's not something that God honors. So Scripture is used for teaching, teaching people about Christ, teaching people about the way, pointing out their errors so that they know when they're doing wrong. And then if they get bullheaded and decide, I'm going to do it regardless. I don't care if the Bible says it's wrong. Then we use it to correct them. And then one of the neat, neatest parts, which is what I think helps it be a lamp and a light to us, it says, and training them for a life that has God's approval. There's another passage in Romans where Paul says, everything that was written before is valuable for instruction. The difference between teaching and training is teaching is about what's already happened. It's about Jesus. Training is about how you can live your life. It's about discipleship. It's about helping you learn and grow like we talked about last week. The cool thing is you don't need a pastor to do all of these things for you. Paul's writing to a pastor and telling him how he should use Scripture. But did you know that you, as a Christian, can study the Bible and use it for teaching? You can use it to point out the errors in your own life. If you've got a spirit that's a spirit of rebellion, you can use it to correct yourself. can study it to see how to live a life that has God's approval. A life of righteousness. The last thing he says is that scripture equips God's servants so that they are completely prepared to do good things. Who wants to be completely prepared to do good things? I know I do. I love the Bible. And I don't care whether you're a a clicker or a flipper or a spender. I don't really care what version of the Bible you use. Those of you who come here all the time, you know that I, I frequently use the God's Word translation. I like how it makes things simple. I use the NIV. I feel like it's one of the most correct versions, one of the most accurate I rarely use King James Version. And I know that some of you may feel about feel like that if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for you. But King James was a long time after Jesus. I like how it sounds, thee, thou, and though, and poetic. But it doesn't matter what version you choose to use. I mean, it does matter. There are bad versions. There are paraphrases that don't say the right things. But as long as you're using a version that is true and correct and in line with the original passages, it doesn't matter what you use. What matters is you use it. Last night we had a group of folks up here who were spreading salt and shoveling the parking lot. Afterwards we all went to dinner to just spend some time together and I loved we sat there at the table and I started to hear people talk about what the Bible had shown them what they'd seen in the Bible recently weird things and funny things and and exciting things and I love hearing people talk about reading the Bible I love hearing that people are spending time in their homes reading the Bible as a family and then discussing it because God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And in this dark, dark world we live in, we really need that light. Giving is easy at Centerpoint. Place your cash or check in the offering. 
give online, or text 777-2027. Your giving makes our impact.